Good evening, everybody. Bonjour, Buju, Tansi, and greetings. Welcome to our fifth webinar in our series of the proposed K-12 education reform, and specifically Bill 64, the Education Modernization Act. Uh, my name is Melanie Jansen. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Education and also the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Research. And it's my pleasure to be your host tonight for our series, uh, for our fifth in the series of reforms regarding Bill 64. These webinars are hosted by both the U of M and the University of Winnipeg and involve researchers from these institutions as well as from Brandon University. We're pleased to be collaborating across institutions um, in an effort to engage in conversations about public education and its role in our democracy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the university campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. For those of you who are joining us from treaty territories or unceded lands elsewhere, I invite you to acknowledge those lands in the chat so we can celebrate all the places um, from which people are residing tonight. I would also like to point out that in this extreme heat and drought across the prairies, that Winnipeg gets its clean and easy to access tap water from Shoal Lake 40 and has since 1919. Shoal Lake 40 continues to have to haul in its own water by truck and by barge. I encourage you to find out more about Shoal Lake 40. Visit their website, buy a t-shirt, follow them on Twitter, or voice your concern about the lack of access to drinking water uh, on reserve by writing to your MP and to our uh, Prime Minister. I would also just like to acknowledge what happened today at the legislature in Manitoba. For those of you who maybe have not had time to catch up on the daily news, Premier Pallister announced his appointment of the new Indigenous Reconciliation Minister, Ellen Lajemodier. At the presser after the appointment, Lajemodier claimed that the residential school system was, quote, designed to take Indigenous children and give them the skills and abilities they would need to fit into society as it moved forward, end quote. This is a gross misrepresentation of the Indian residential school system and of the Canadian government's intentions and policies. And worse, it is immensely disrespectful of the residential school survivors, of those who were lost to the residential school system, and of the generations of families affected by residential schools. As Canadians, Indigenous peoples and settlers alike, we must stand up and stand together in support of truth and reconciliation. And now for our panel presentation. It's kind of an awkward transition. <laughs> I apologize for that. Tonight's session is entitled Bill 64 as Neoliberal Reform, Accountability, Managerialism, and Individualism. We have three presenters or panelists tonight, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to all three of them. First, we'll have Dr. Shannon Moore. She's an assistant professor of social studies education in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning at the University of Manitoba. Through her research, Dr. Moore explores student responses to social justice pedagogy, gender, media education, and media literacies in the social studies context, as well as the use of digital video production in pedagogy and research. She is currently employing critical discourse analysis to consider the ways in which neoliberal discourses are reconfiguring teaching and curriculum, undermining public education, and destabilizing democracy in the Canadian context. After Shannon, we'll have Dr. Martha Coach. Dr. Coach is an associate professor and recently appointed associate dean of undergraduate programs and partnerships at the University of Manitoba. Her areas of research include exploring ways to support K-12 teachers as they further develop their approach to mathematics teaching and learning, ways of using digital technology to represent connections in school mathematics, and studying teachers' use of assessment to support learning in various subject areas. Dr. Coach works with a number of educational organizations, including the Canadian Assessment for Learning Network. After Martha, we'll have Dr. Alicia Farrell. Dr. Farrell is an associate professor at Brandon University and chair of the Leadership and Educational Administration Department. 
Dr. Farrell uses arts-based research methods and studies leaders, leadership, and leading in times of crises. Her award-winning PhD dissertation was published into a book entitled Exploring the Affective Dimensions of Educational Leadership. Dr. Farrell is currently researching and writing about eco-justice in leadership. I have asked each presenter to speak for about 20 minutes on their topic, at which time we will open up for a Q&A uh, following the panel. I encourage you to please use the Q&A function and, and not the chat function to submit your questions and I will do my best to sort through and ask our panelists the burning questions that arise. And, um, and then we'll close all together at the end of the session. So thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your uh, July summer vacation for those of you who are educators to be with us. Um, I'm most thrilled to be hosting this panel session with my colleagues and my friends. And so without further ado, uh, let's begin with Dr. Shannon Moore. Shannon. Melanie, can you let me know that it's showing in full screen, please? Yep, it's good to go. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So as Melanie mentioned, my name is Shannon, and I'm going to be speaking today in a section I've called neoliberal fingerprints. I, I thought today earlier, should I just call it neoliberal fingernails, but I decided to go with fingerprints. So in my portion of the evening, I want to go back and consider the underlying ideology that informs Bill 64. That is through my presentation, I will look at what is under the bill. I will begin by defining the ideology of neoliberalism and elucidate how it seeks to reframe public education in our province. Before speaking specifically about Manitoba, I will briefly outline how neoliberal reformers have been motivating changes to public education across Canada. I do this to demonstrate that my concerns about this legislation arise from a larger context. The consequences of these reforms in other provinces serve as a warning to Manitoba. As Chomsky states, public education is the gem of democracy. Public schools are essential in challenging inequity, promoting critically engaged citizens, and providing the space for public debate. Following Kuhn, if we are able to achieve the democratic ideal of equity, there must be a commons, and it must be accessible for all to participate effectively. Canadians recognize this. Public education is widely supported in our country. Despite this support, provincial governments across Canada continue to pass legislation and enact policies that undermine the public system. By enculturating and imposing a market logic, neoliberal reformers are compromising a public good. Neoliberalism is an economic ideology in which the market is the organizing principle for all political, social, and economic decisions. It privileges the rule of the market, advances cuts to social services, promotes deregulation, and encourages privatization. In Michael Apple's words, for neoliberals, there is one form of rationality that is more powerful than any other, economic rationality. Efficiency and an ethic of cost-benefit analysis are the dominant norms. All people are to act in ways that maximize their own personal benefits. Within this marketplace, individualism reigns, citizens are positioned as consumers, and democracy is undermined. Neoliberalism, Giroux states, wages an incessant attack on democracy, public goods, and non-commodified values. Since the 1980s, this extreme form of capitalism has waged a war against public education and all vestiges of the common good and social contract. These attacks intensify and legitimize social inequalities, according to Wendy Brown. Education is a target of the neoliberal project for two reasons, according to Wayne Ross, the market size and the capacity to foster critical engaged citizens. So how have we seen this ideology emerge in education? Neoliberalism has manifested in which Salberg has termed GERM, the global education reform movement. These reforms include increased competition between educational institutions, commodification of education that positions students as consumers, 
and powerful systems of accountability tied to performance standards for both students and teachers. Neoliberalism naturalizes individualism and competition through curriculum, grading, and testing, all of which then require accountability measurements and managerialism. In turn, privatization becomes apparent common sense and any promotion of collective responsibility is labeled ideological, an excellent built-in defense mechanism. I share this chart with you on the screen to speak to the ways that Kuhn, Matheson, and Ross speak about the incompatibility of a market-based logic, which is imposed on education through neoliberalism, and a plan for education. So just in looking at these bullets beside each other, one can see how incompatible these systems and logics are. Using this lovely graphic from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, I want to talk about the consequences of neoliberalism across Canada. Many Canadians may be unaware that public education in many provinces is no longer fully publicly funded. Funding cuts alongside neoliberal rationale helped privatization creep into schools across Canada in many forms. Through various means, schools in Canada now raise over $200 million annually. There have also been consequences for the market actors within the system. Divisions between principal teachers who are rebranded as administrators and teachers are exacerbated as their focus turns to management rather than pedagogical leadership. Within this new managerialism, there is an increased focus on auditing, measurement, and surveillance for both students and teachers. Moreover, the turn to tests reframes the purpose of education, understandings of learning, and of teacher professionalism. These are just some of the consequences we have already seen across Canada because of this neoliberal tide. So if 95% of Canadians choose public school for their children, and publicly funded, funded education is broadly supported, how is it that neo neoliberal reforms are gaining traction across Canada? This support is ma manufactured, I would argue, in three ways. First, the public system is eroded through a combination of, of austerity measures and persistent defunding. We have seen this in Manitoba, where since 2016, the government has tightened funding across all public sectors, including schools. Following Molly McCracken's research, since 2016, provincial funding for K-12 education has declined in real dollars by 7.6% on a compounded basis. Moreover, as Dr. Yun from our faculty, Dr. Young and, Doc, and, and uh, Emily Livingston point out, the current government focuses funding on what they deem core functions or the basics, excluding all others. This, of course, creates a crisis and is used to justify private investment and market-based solutions. These solutions will supposedly be more efficient and aid public institutions who are positioned as mismanaged and wasteful. And if they were run like businesses, they would be better with no idea of what better is or who or what it is better for. Also, there are countless examples of businesses running efficiently while causing profound social, economic, envir and environmental consequences. So I'm not sure why that is the model we would want to turn to. The real crisis is the lack of public investment and the preoccupation with cutting costs. Rather than recognizing the importance of public investment education, neoliberal reformers view divestment in education as an opportunity for profit, according to Farhadi. That is, lack of government investment results in a deteriorating public education system. This allows private corporations to then step in and become the saviors of education, filling the gaps from everything from food programs, shared costs and in infrastructure, to curriculum, all for monetary gain. In turn, education is increasingly defined as an industry and educational institutions have been forced to conduct themselves more and more like profit-seeking firms. Before launching into the second way, I think that these trends are catching on despite a lack of public support. I would like to um, speak to the way that neoliberal reforms are gaining traction. <clears throat> I would like to pause here to outline what is wrong with inviting private investment in public education. After all, some may view this as an opportunity to, to decrease taxes and to share the cost of public education who, 
with people who just want to help out. Having lived and worked in BC until 2019, I have seen the consequences of BC's School Amendment Act of 2002, which, which first enabled, then encouraged, and eventually required school divisions to behave like incorporated businesses. This model in BC helped normalize divestment from public education. If provinces further down the neoliberal path are any indication, austerity measures, public divestment, and persistent defunding have resulted in school divisions being forced to run like businesses, which undeniably pulls the focus from education towards money-making. Moreover, once school divisions begin generating in a revenue, those profits are expected and the government uses the, them to justify further divestment, which in turn requires boards then to continually make this revenue annually. These profits are often generated by renting out school space, which impedes extracurricular activities for students in the school. They're also derived from exporting curriculum, which contributes to a globalization of curriculum. It's also derived from importing students, which is an unethical practice if no supports for, exist for international students once they get here. Finally, it is derived through fundraising, which Yun and Young describe, sorry, Yun and Young describe has led to sharpened inequities as schools in wealthier areas have increased fundraising capacity. It has also led to increased forms of what's called sorry, <laughs> philanthropy capitalism, that is private actors using their resources to solve society's problems as members of the community, while also creating a positive public relations image for themselves. As Winton and Milani point out, this rewards schools who can raise large sums of money and also institutionalizes private money in public schools. Out of necessity, there are also increased reliance on public-private partnerships in Canadian schools. This neoliberal trend also increases inequities as school boards that are more desirable because of geographic location, which I definitely saw when I lived in BC, West Vancouver, obviously is a location people would like to go and visit and go to school, or who have higher, higher test scores, which we all know is also tied to socioeconomics, tend to attract more students. This has encouraged competition between school divisions to attract more students. Further, as Yun et al. point out, this practice normalizes the dependency on private funds and risks creating a dependent relationship in which school divisions need private funds and private corporations can begin, begin to dictate terms and gain influence. All of this, I'll remind you, was supposedly created to get rid of the inequities uh, that result from property taxes, when in fact we can see in other provinces it's actually exacerbated inequities. Now I, rec I recognize that you may have forgotten what I was talking about before that little commercial about funding, um, but I felt it necessary to stop and outline the risks of relying on a business model to fund education. Understandable that you might have forgotten where I'm at, so I will remind you I was trying to elucidate how these reforms are advancing absent public support. So how are they getting pushed through when in fact we know that the mass of the populace is in favor of public education? The first, as I stated, was the creation of a crisis through intentional defunding. The second rationale, as Jansen and I have previously written about, as have many others, is the way in which standardized test scores are used to fuel the idea that there is a crisis that needs to be addressed. This crisis rhetoric relies on flawed logic and faulty understandings about the purpose of education, teaching, learning, and the very legitimacy of the tests. And I recognize I've just gone ahead one slide, so you get to see the slides twice, I apologize. The third way in which these unsupported reforms are gaining traction is through the dazzle of rhetoric. For example, the use of the term modernization feeds the crisis narrative. What I'm saying there is that it positions education as regressive and in need of a major overhaul, simply by the use of the term modernize. Recently, we have seen the rhetorical wave of modernization sweep across Canada. So as you'll see on the screen, I have included how every province has been using it, and not just in education, it's used in many different uh, government policies and practices. With modernization in the, in the title of the bill, Bill 64 is drawing on the same tactics, rationale, and rhetoric. Modernization has become the term of the moment 
used as a catch-all to advance neoliberal policies. It is indicative of the constant shift in terminology used to justify and rationalize reforms. As Chris Stu points out, it is an old tactic with a new costume. It is the term progress rebranded. The new catchy slogan used to sell us all on selling out our education system. Modernization, while sounding futuristic, is one of the oldest euphemisms in the education handbook, as Farhadi points out. The term modernization was first used to institute 19th century public schools with the goal of social, moral, intellectual, and economic elevation. It is now a catch-all for austerity measures, central to which are cuts in public expenditure. This empty word, with no clear articulation of what is meant by modernized, is used across Canada. It is legitimized alongside crisis narratives. It is repeated to help gain buy-in. And the title of Bill 64, along with the content of the bill, are indicative of the trends towards increased neoliberal reforms and the imposition of a market logic. So I'm just going to end today by elucidating what some of that market logic is by reviewing some of what we've already heard through this series. So as my peers have spoken about through this series, this has manifest in the perception that knowledge is fixed and consumable, which is reinforced by standardization of the curriculum, increased testing, and coincident accountability measures. It has also manifest in the reframing of the purpose of education. Despite having no idea what the future will look like for a student entering kindergarten today and not doing anything to protect the environment necessary for a future, the BEST document advocates for future-ready students that are determined by employer need, entry into labor markets, success in tomorrow's workplace, career-related and employment-ready experiences, and responsiveness and alignment to labor market needs. The only skills we can be sure will continue to be needed in the future are those of critical thinking, creative thinking, critical media literacies, problem solving, deliberation and discussion, and those are relatively absent, if not completely absent, from the bill and the accompanying best document. It has also reframed the role of teaching. Bill 64 and BEST, like other reform agendas, asserts and reframes the responsibilities of teacher from that of an ethical responsibility to that of the responsabilization of teaching, according to McLeod, where the work of teaching is being recast by terms reflective of policy technologies of the market and managerialism, according to Ball, as is evidenced in the push for increased efficiencies, accountability, and effectiveness. This responsabilization of teaching has the effect of increasing teacher surveillance and individualism, and thus undermining the collective, including teacher societies and unions. Moreover, Reframing the teacher through responsabilization undermines the ethical and relational aspects of teaching. And most importantly, I think it has changed our view of students and created a market-based understanding of students as consumers of knowledge and producers in the workforce. As John Weens warned in the, in the Winnipeg Free Press earlier this year, we're on a slippery slope when children are seen only as useful objects, commodities, they are not expendable, interchangeable raw materials, resources or products, goods and services to be refined for and exchanged in the marketplace. Even though they exist in abundance, they are not exchangeable or a replaceable likeness. And I'll end today with what I think is one of the most powerful quotes against neoliberalism. When humans are only constructed as human capital, they become valued for capital generation, which has the effect of increasing individualism and competition, which magnifies inequities between players, undermines collective labor and labor groups, and erodes concern for the public good. As Wendy Brown poignantly asserts, neoliberalism is the rationality through which capitalism finally swallows humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, we'll now turn it over to Dr. Coach. Good evening, everyone. I assume that someone will let me know in the chat if you cannot see my uh, screen or cannot uh, hear <laughs> what I am saying. Um, so it is great to be here this evening, and uh, I want to thank the University of Winnipeg and the University of Manitoba for hosting this series and inviting me to share some ideas about test-based accountability. I am joining tonight from Treaty 57 land, 
which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Huron, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Making a land acknowledgement is one way I choose to show a commitment to reconciliation. Wearing an orange t-shirt is a visible way to acknowledge the grievous harm done to Indigenous children and communities through the residential school system. I believe that as a professor and educational researcher, it is also my responsibility to work toward reconciliation through actions such as responding to Bill 64, which as others have discussed in previous webinars, is silent on the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and shamefully avoids recognizing the role that K-12 education can and must have in reconciliation. And so it is in this spirit that I share some research that shows beyond any shadow of doubt that the Palestine government is both misleading and misguided in their plans to implement test-based accountability in Manitoba. I wanna focus uh, first on my decision to use the word misleading in my title. I will preface this part of my talk by saying that, like most of you, I am not a lawyer, nor do I have experience with the specialized vocabulary used to write provincial legislation. But even without that knowledge, it is evident that the Manitoba government is intentionally misleading the public in their communications about the objectives of this bill. There are many examples that I could share of these misleading messages, but our time is limited. And so I will focus on a news release that was made on June 14, when the government announced the creation of their fact versus fiction web page. The web page is supposed to clear up what Education Minister Cliff Cullen is describing as a misinformation campaign uh, related to both the BEST strategy and Bill 64. The press release includes the statement that teachers will not be penalized for the assessment results of their students, and that while the focus will be placed on enhancing classroom supports in the BEST strategy, there is no reference to assessment within the proposed legislation. The first part of the sentence that refers to the BEST strategy is a bit ambiguous. I'm not sure what the meaning of it is, but the last part of the sentence highlighted here in red seems to be a very clear statement. There is no reference to assessment within Bill 64. The problem is that this claim is untrue. A quick look at the text of the bill reveals several references to assessment. On this slide, I've captured a screenshot of section 18, not a very interesting visual slide, um, but I did want to quote directly from the text of the bill. The passage explicitly refers to assessment several times, uh, as highlighted on this slide, including that the minister may prescribe the methods and procedures for the assessment of educational programs and of any aspect of student achievement. And the minister may prescribe the form and content of reporting by teachers to parents about their children's achievement. Reporting to parents is assessment. And so the claim that Bill 64 makes no reference to assessment is demonstrably false and I would say intentionally misleading. While section 18 uses the word assessment explicitly, there are also many passages where um, other words or phrases are used to signify assessment. A few examples are shown on this slide. Um, section 16 holds the Provincial Education Authority accountable for uh, achieving standards. Section 17 gives the minister the power to specify outcomes and the performance measures used to determine if outcomes have been achieved. That's assessment. And section 19, where we see the phrase balanced scorecard reporting, a phrase that's repeated several times uh, in Bill 64, also relates directly to assessment. And so we see that Bill 64 makes many references to assessment. These references to assessment also show that the government intends to introduce test-based accountability, even though this is being presented in a transparent manner. I want to turn just for a moment to the BEST report. Um, I don't presume to understand how this report relates to Bill 64 in a technical or legal sense. However, I have noticed that when responding to questions about Bill 64, Minister Cullen often toggles back and forth between the two documents in ways that create a great deal of confusion while avoiding clearly communicating their intentions. 
Like the other red flags that I have raised this evening, the BEST report often refers to national and international rankings as indicators of educational outcomes, while other valuable indicators of effective and equitable education are not mentioned. I am disappointed to see that the report has, as the first of four pillars, governance and accountability, and very distressed to see that the accountability pillar will rely almost exclusively on standardized assessments. In describing the accountability pillar, again, the text on the slide comes from the report. The province refers to school level assessment data that will be publicly available and refers to strategies to enhance performance measurement, clearly signaling their intent to gather data beyond what is currently available. And so I think we can be quite certain that their intention is to implement a test-based accountability system, despite the misleading information provided in the recent news release. So that brings me to the second um, key word in my title, misguided. Implementing test-based accountability is misguided because it means that we will be ignoring a vast collection of peer-reviewed research conducted in countries around the world. And because test-based accountability will have the same negative impacts for individual learners, particularly those who are already marginalized, and for the whole K-12 system, as have been extensively documented elsewhere. Rather than a step towards so-called modernization, and we have heard about some of the difficulties with that term, test-based accountability is repeating well-known errors of the past in some sort of a Groundhog Day nightmare. So I wanna share a bit of the research with you this evening about that test-based accountability. Research clearly shows that test-based accountability systems not only fail to bring about the improvements that they claim that they will foster, but they actually have a measurably negative impact. That is, they diminish K-12 education in measurable ways. As expressed by Nichols and Berliner, there is absolutely no need for new research. Sufficient evidence already exists that shows the harmful effects of accountability testing and assessment experts agree that the demands made by politicians exceed what tests can actually effectively measure. Now, they made that statement in 2007, about 15 years ago, and at that time, they called for a moratorium on test-based accountability systems. Since that time, the standards for educational testing, as well as a steady stream of journal articles, books, and other publications, just a few are shown on this slide, have presented research findings from all over the world demonstrating the negative impacts of test-based accountability. I've read so much about this topic over the past 20 years and also conducted studies into problems with test-based accountability in Canada that I had a hard time deciding what to squeeze into the time that we have this evening. And so I decided to limit myself to four areas that are well documented in, in the measurement literature. It may seem counterintuitive to you, but measurement experts are among the strongest opponents of test-based accountability systems because they have studied these systems and found that they do not adhere to fundamental principles of valid, fair, and reliable measurement. Measurement experts know that most test-based accountability systems do not follow the standards that have been established for educational measurement. So the first area I want to talk a little bit about is uh, that measurement experts agree that even well-developed tests provide only a snapshot taken at a moment in time. We know that tests can only include a limited number of items or if they take too long for students to complete. They also include a limited range of types of items, often favoring items that can be scored efficiently. And so we know that any test can only assess a small sample of whatever it is we're trying to measure. We also know from research that many test takers cannot fully demonstrate their learning on a timed pencil and paper test. Standardized tests privilege some learners over others. Those who can best show their learning in written format have a considerable advantage. So for all the others, that snapshot that the test provides turns out to be a much blurrier picture. Measurement experts also know it is difficult and costly to develop items that assess things like critical thinking or problem solving, um, and so many tests focus more on knowledge recall rather than the deeper learning that we all value and, and many of the things that Shannon mentioned uh, in, in her talk. 
measurement experts are also very aware that tests cannot be culturally neutral or value free and that they tend to privilege white middle class values and worldviews. Ethnic, cultural, socioeconomic and linguistic differences always influence test results despite ongoing attempts by test developers to reduce what we refer to as test bias. That means that when test results are used in accountability systems, they perpetuate the unfounded idea that non-dominant students are inferior. And this is a pattern that's been identified all around the world, including in Canada with regard to Indigenous students and other marginalized groups. In contrast, other forms of assessment, such as culturally responsive assessment, can provide a much clearer picture of the learning that is achieved by all learners, not just those from the dominant group for whom a test has been designed. And just to show you that my point is widely shared among measurement experts, this slide shows a quotation from a report written by the PISA team, stating that the data collected by PISA offer, quote, a snapshot of education systems at a moment in time, but they do not, and this is in their own words, they can show how the system got to that point. They do not say much about cause and effect. So PISA states that their scores only provide a snapshot, and yet these scores and other test scores are often viewed as a precise, clear, and definitive representation of the quality of our education system. Which leads into my second area of concern. Measurement experts agree that test scores are being used inappropriately in accountability systems and that they become hegemonic. Each standardized test is developed for a specific purpose, but they are frequently used for a wide range of other purposes after they've been developed. Measurement standards state that evidence must be gathered to demonstrate that the way a test score is being used is appropriate. This is the process known as test validation, but it is very rarely done for tests that are used for accountability purposes. And not only are tests used in ways that do not fit with the purposes for which they were designed, they are often used as the sole basis for decision making, even though measurement standards repeatedly caution that a single test score or set of test scores should never be the basis of decision making. And yet again, we see this practice repeated over and over. Looking again at the PISA assessment as an example, we can see some of the ways that their scores are used inappropriately. This uh, simple graphic shows uh, some scores from the 2018 reading assessment from uh, the PISA. The OECD average I've shown um, at one end of the, of the graphic uh, is, is 487, and there are many scores below that. That's the average. Um, Canada, uh, on this particular occasion, uh, came in with a score of 520. Um, and that was sixth out of the 79 countries that participated. Manitoba's score uh, is reported at 494. What's not often repeated along with that number, so we just hear the number, we don't hear the other ideas, is that Manitoba's score is not significantly different from Prince Edward Island, Denmark, Norway, Saskatchewan, Germany, Belgium, France, and New Brunswick. So again, we don't get a full picture, we just get the hegemonic score, and that is supposed to be um, enough information um, for us, and, and I think that's really very problematic. There's also lots of contextual information gathered by PISA and by lots of other um, um, folks that, that is of value here. So on that reading assessment in 2018, uh, an analysis was done just of the Canadian students who participated, and the results of that analysis show unequivocally that socially economically advantaged students outperformed disadvantaged students across Canada, across Canada, by 68 score points. And so, given the child poverty rates in Manitoba as compared with other parts of Canada, if you look at PISA scores more closely, we are actually doing quite well to be only 26 points below the Canadian average. But again, this additional contextual information is not discussed in the BVST report. Uh, they just refer to the rankings. And so there are just infinite examples of this kind of thing happening with test scores. I don't want to sort of get too far into those examples this evening, but just to reiterate that point. 
My third uh, area is the negative consequences of test-based accountability are very well known and have been researched in many countries that have used this system. these systems. Lots of evidence of narrowing curriculum and instructional time to tested subjects, which are usually math and English and sometimes science, um, with the scheduled class time for other subject areas being reduced. Again, we find this in research. It's not, not just a myth. Studies uh, have shown that moving to test-based accountability results in more teachers uh, reverting to a traditional pedagogy, such as rote memorization and direct instruction. We find that even within the tests that get, the subjects that get tested, there are negative uh, consequences, a narrowing of instruction to easily tested and less complex elements of the curriculum. So in mathematics, we see less time spent on problem solving. Uh, in English language arts, we see less time spent on creative writing and other extended forms of writing. This pattern of narrowing of curriculum and reverting to traditional forms of teaching has been especially found to occur for low achieving students and for low scoring schools. And again, that's in many countries. Another consequence that you might not be so familiar with that I just wanna spend a minute explaining um, is something that we call um, bubble students. And so what this phenomenon is, is that students who are close to getting a pass and you know, if we just do a little work with them, they might bump up over the, whatever is considered the acceptable score on, a, on, a, on an accountability assessment. Um, uh, some schools and divisions in their desperate attempt to function within the system will focus a great deal of attention on those students who are just right below the bar. And what research shows us is that less attention than is paid to struggling learners who are a little further below that, who really there's very little chance that they're going to make it, you know, sort of across that, that, that bar. And so this is very troubling that we would see these kinds of consequences uh, from um, these uh, test-based accountability uh, systems. Other documented uh, research showing migration of experienced teachers away from grades where these assessments occur, greater teacher stress, increased stress and anxiety for students, um, studies showing serious impacts on mental health in some cases for students, but also reduced motivation and reduced confidence among students, again, especially found to occur um, among those students who are already disadvantaged. The last thing I'll say about negative consequences, honestly, I could talk for hours on this alone, is that the high cost of developing quality assessments takes an enormous amount of resource away from more meaningful educational initiatives. Measuring not, something does nothing really to address those concerns. And then if we don't spend um, a fair amount of money developing these tests, um, what ends up happening is we have even less valid measures being used. Uh, and so that's not a good option either. My fourth uh, area then to share with you this evening is that test-based accountability is not meaningful accountability. Um, there is wide agreement um, on this point. Numerous studies uh, show that the No Child Left Behind policy, which had lots of test-based accountability in it, had little impact on student performance or on reducing achievement gaps between white and black students across the U.S. Hutchings, in her extensive analysis of accountability systems in the United Kingdom, also revealed that it has not resulted in positive changes and has had many negative impacts. Even the UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report 2017 indicates that test-based accountability in many countries leads to narrowing curriculum, teaching to the test, and other negative consequences. And again, disproportionately affects disadvantaged schools and students. Test-based accountability systems give us no insights about things that we care about. How well are we meeting the needs of learners with special needs? How are we doing with anti-racism education? What about Indigenous engagement? How are we doing with that? Or with so many other things that students, parents, members of the Manitoba public, educators, and those of you listening this evening, no doubt, value. Teachers have often expressed their concerns um, with regard to test-based accountability. This quotation comes from a secondary teacher in a study that was done in the UK. I couldn't even choose an image to put on this slide because of the, the strength of what is in these words. The secondary teacher says, I am now burnt out with an accountability measures. I bitterly regret coming into teaching because it is not about teaching children and setting them off on a passion for lifelong learning. It's about setting them up to feel worthless and insecure and anxious. I don't feel like a professional anymore. 
And of course, this teacher is not alone um, in these in this perspective. Um, lots of other examples uh, can be found. Chicago teachers, supported by parents, started a strike and organized demonstrations against the negative impact of test-based accountability systems. Parents groups also feel that test-based accountability is not meaningful accountability. Uh, for instance, the More Than a Score parent group in the UK advocates for more meaningful information about their children's learning. Closer to home, the nonprofit organization People for Education has been working on a project called Measuring What Matters um, in Ontario. Students have also been involved uh, in Chile in 2011. Huge numbers of students demonstrated against the negative impact of test-based accountability, and that resulted in subsequent boycotts of the test that was being used there. Test-based accountability is on its way out and should not be any part of education reform in Manitoba. And I'll just close with a couple of slides and some other perspectives on accountability, because there are other ways that we can go. Uh, other uh, models of accountability that can provide the valuable insights about how taxpayer funds are being spent and about how well we are doing in many dimensions of K-12 education, not just those snapshots that come from standardized tests. Some scholars have been working on what they're calling intelligent accountability systems, which are being developed to ensure that accountability promotes social justice rather than contributing to inequities, um, as we see with test-based approaches. In fact, there was a special issue of the Journal of Educational Change in 2020 that was devoted entirely to more effective accountability systems with articles contributed by researchers from around the world. Another example of accountability that is not test-based is the system that has been put in place in Finland for many years, which is often referred to as a professional responsibility model of accountability. A central feature of, of Finnish education systems is that they do not have top-down quality control mechanisms. It's bottom-up, locally regulated. So back in the 1990s, when the Thatcher government in the UK was bringing in test-based accountability systems, and some Canadian provinces were too, Finland moved, away, moved in the other direction toward a radical decentralization of their educational governance, the exact opposite of what we see proposed in Bill 64. In Finland, educators see it as their professional responsibility to self-evaluate regularly. There are no standardized tests, so school rankings are not possible. But school improvement does happen, and it happens in meaningful ways. And there are lots of other options too. Several countries use accreditation processes for K-12 accountability, similar to the way we would accredit higher education institutions in Canada. Those processes go well beyond test scores to include interviews, observations, and other qualitative information about school culture, leadership, community engagement, and equity. Um, and these accountability systems have the advantage of providing rich and detailed information that can actually inform school improvement, which again goes well beyond the snapshot that we would get from a standardized test score. We also see accountability redefined as an ongoing formative assessment and feedback process. These are approaches being used in Denmark, where the publication of assessment results is forbidden by law. And in Portugal, in Uruguay, in Norway, we also see a focus on assessment for learning as a key tool of educational accountability, not standardized tests. So there are lots of options for accountability. We do not need to use a test-based approach in this province. And this is my final slide where I will say that more progressive approaches to accountability, what some have called accountability 2.0, could be very successful in our province. We have a vibrant education community with active professional organizations, teachers, superintendents, and school boards. Many of you are here this evening. We have faculties of education, the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center, and not-for-profit groups such as Newcomer Education Coalition and the Winnipeg Indigenous Education Circle who gather and report information about the state of equity in education in our province. Working collaboratively with these many stakeholder groups using a model such as intelligent accountability can and should be at the heart of our educational reform, not the Groundhog Day nightmare of an outdated, ineffective, and harmful test-based accountability system. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to questions and comments um, after our next presenter.
There we go. Thank you, Martha. Um, now we'll turn it over to Dr. Farrell. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of you tonight. I'm grateful for uh, the work of our moderator, Dr. Melanie Jansen, the work she did to bring us together, the thoughtful arguments presented by my colleagues, Dr. Shannon Moore and Dr. Martha Koch, and to every Manitoban who's engaged in discussions about Bill 64. As a mom first, and then as a researcher and a teacher, I'm keenly interested in educational questions that relate to eco-justice and the affective dimensions of leading and learning in precarious times. That said, as my news feeds have flooded with images of forest fires, dry dugouts, and smoke forecasts this month, I've been asking myself more frequently, what does it mean to modernize education in the face of the Earth's decreasing habitability? If the essence of public education assumes a future, one would presume the climate crisis would take up at least a little space in the minds of those who are in the process of radically restructuring education in the province. So out of the myriad of issues with Bill 64's focus on standardization, accountability, efficiency and competition, many of those already discussed by Shannon and Martha, Tonight, I'd like to draw attention to how the Education Modernization Act disavows the threat climate change poses to future generations of school children and how it injects the beautiful complexity um, of education with a narcissistic simplicity, one that works against our ability um, to understand the ecological, social, and cultural and ethical econo and economic impacts of climate change. In the first part of my presentation, I'll share a few reminders about the wider ecological context, and next I'll discuss a few of my specific concerns about how educational leadership is framed in Bill 64, and the implementation guide called Better Education Starts Today, to show how these reforms work against building healthier school communities. I'll conclude with an alternative view of educational leadership, one that fosters mutual recognition and a focus on interdependence. We know that over the last three decades, the Canadian Arctic has been warming at twice the global rate. As more glaciers disappear, more of the bedrock in the Arctic is exposed, and the heat from the newly exposed bedrock further accelerates the melting process. Last August, some of you might have been shocked to learn, the last fully intact ice shelf in the Canadian Arctic collapsed. In two days at the end of July, it lost 43% of its area, approximately 81 square kilometers. A little closer to home, you might be zooming from. Uh, on July 6th, CTV captured this image of Winnipeg's smoky sky. That day, Environment Canada issued a poor air quality statement for parts of Manitoba. They warned, quote, even healthy people can get sore eyes, tears, coughing, and a runny nose, end quote. When Mike Flanagan, a forest fire researcher, was asked by the people at Climate Atlas of Canada what climate change means for wildfires in Canada, he said, in a word, the future is smoky. Just over a week ago, the St. Laurent community declared a state of agricultural emergency. Manitoba farmer Tom Johnson said, I'll be 64 years old in November, and I've been farming here my whole life, and I've never seen it this dry. As far as hay goes, there's absolutely no amount for hay. The grasshoppers are eating what's there, and everyone is sitting back waiting to see if we're gonna get a little bit of rain. In 2018, the IPCC produced a report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and related global greenhouse gas emissions. The report states that human activities are estimated to have caused approximately one degree Celsius of global warming above pre-industrial levels, and that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052 if it continues to increase at the current rate. As a result, climate-related risks to health and education systems, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security, and economic growth are projected to increase with global warming of 1.5 degrees and increase further with 2 degrees. The news isn't pretty, my friends, but it sure is urgent. But there are many things that we could do to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. 
and education can play a powerful role in developing climate literacy and the creation and promotion of mitigation efforts. And their 2017 report called Changing Minds, Not the Climate, the Role of Education, UNESCO affirms, education, and I quote, is the most powerful element in preparing societies for the global challenges that climate change brings. It equips individuals, communities, and the wider world with the understanding, skills, and attitudes to engage in shaping green and low emission and climate resilient societies. So how are we currently doing on the climate change literacy front in Canada, and more specifically in Manitoba? And will Bill 64, or BEST, get us where we urgently need to go? Wines and Nicholas conducted a study of the climate science curricula across Canadian secondary schools. They found secondary school curricula across the country gives little emphasis to scientific consensus of the anthropogenic causes of climate change or the actions people can take to mitigate the negative impacts of global warming. Notably, in the paper they published in 2019, they called attention to the supplementary material included with the grade 11 chemistry curriculum in Manitoba. It recommends reading material by the quote, Friends of Science, an organization described as opposing the IPCC data about climate change. And I guess I'd like to remind people at this point that the data coming out from the IPCC is quite conservative according to many climate scientists at this point. On page 159 of the document, it says, it should be noted there is a significantly polarized debate on the issue among scientists. Students should be justifiably cautious about accepting unsubstantiated claims about global warming, end quote. In a country that is literally catching fire more frequently, we have work to do in terms of confronting the lack of focus on the anthropogenic causes of global warming in schools and in teacher education programs. So I have to tell you, when I read the first sentence under the banner of Better Education Starts Today on the Government of Manitoba's webpage, I felt really hopeful. It reads, and I quote, every student, no matter their background, where they live, or their individual abilities deserves an education that prepares them for success in a rapidly changing world. In fact, it was this sentence that prompted me to download a copy of the BEST document and to do a search for terms related to eco-justice, enhancing climate literacy, and mitigating the impacts of global warming. And this is what I found. Nowhere in Better Education Starts Today is there a reference to the environmental precarity that will seriously impact the lives of, quote, future ready students. This reductive view of our field makes it virtually impossible to notice or speak to the vast changes in the web of life that are cascading across the earth with greater intensity. To me, this is madness in a void of language to describe it as such. So if there's nothing about climate change or other aspects of exceeding the Earth's ecological limits in terms of, quote, preparing students for success in a rapidly changing world, what are the aims of Bill 64, the Education Modernization Act, and what kind of leadership in the field of education is this? Leadership to what end? I began by analyzing uh, part six of section 96 of bill 64 under the heading of the duties of principal in relation to part four, the education authority and part five, local participation in public education system of governance to better understand how bill 64 constructs educational leadership. My analysis reveals bill 64 constructs school principals as monitors, managers, disciplinarians and reporters, which is an insufficient frame to deal with the complex and transdisciplinary challenges school leaders will face as the climate crisis intensifies. What is absent from the portrait of educational leaders painted in Bill 64 are references to A, understanding education is not self-enclosed, but a complex interdependent ecological process, and B, leaders who can identify the trajectories in school communities that impede students' abilities to live a good life, which is what we want for all our kids. And by good life, I mean having clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, healthy food to eat, affordable housing, a loving community, and robust and inclusive opportunities to learn from the more than human world. And I'm sorry to say that if you turn to Bill 64's implementation guide, Better Education Starts Today, to find a more complex articulation of educational leadership, you might be left wanting. 
As an example, one of three priority actions focuses on accountability through the creation of a provincial school leadership framework. Assuming, I guess, the needs of Burntwood Elementary School in Thompson are the same as the needs of River Heights School in Winnipeg. Such a limited understanding of educational leadership diminishes the intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and contemplative dimensions of the contextually responsive educational leadership we need in precarious times. Eco-linguistic scholar Aaron Stibbe, he challenges all of us to examine what he calls the stories we live by and the stories people in power live by when we're trying to make really big decisions about the right thing to do. His work has been invaluable to me as I've analyzed Bill 64 and BEST. That said, another body of data I found very compelling uh, and helpful when examining the neo-leadership tropes embedded in Bill 64 were the stories, images, and metaphors, metaphors shared by some of the drivers of the Educational Modernization Act. A 20-minute presentation does not permit me to share multiple examples but I would like to share one from the Premier's press conference on July 7th, in which he spoke about the toppling of the Queen Elizabeth II statue and the statue of Queen Victoria on Canada Day. In response to the Premier's comments, York Factory Chief Leroy Constant, who was serving as the interim Grand Chief said, Quote, to minimize, romanticize, and celebrate the settler colonialism that displaced First Nations from their ancient and sacred lands in the most brutal and heinous ways, the way he did in his comments is unconscionable and a desecration to the graves of the ancestors on which the legislator is built and on which the city of Winnipeg now lies, end quote. Others noted the Premier's comments were a setback for reconciliation efforts and an example of dog whistling. After reading through the transcript of his comments, I also found evidence of some of the stories Premier pa Brian Pallister lives by in his role as an architect of Bill 64. And they're worth paying attention to because issues of settler colonialism, ecological degradation, and his views of education are deeply intertwined. So here's just a sample uh, from the press conference. So I just wanna draw attention to four of the phrases. So the first one, people also have to have the will to use the tools they are given. In a sentence like that, the person is assuming people don't have their own skills and he dismisses the knowledge, wisdom, and lived experiences of others. It's whitewashing structural racism and settler colonialism by downloading the responsibility of overcoming systemic injustices to the will of the individual. The next phrase I'd like to draw your attention to is this use of the words, uh, phrase self-sufficient people. He highly values individualism and he sees interdependence as a weakness. The next phrase, to fix our finances to make us stronger. This is evidence of boomernomics, which Todd Dufresne describes as, quote, the shift from production and need to consumption and desire, the high value assigned to audit culture and metrics, the quantification of job performance, the belief that efficiency and continuous improvement are good in themselves, and the reverence given to strategic planning, mission statements, outcome and managerial expertise, and so on. And the last piece, take that same formula. Here he applies boomernomics to all facets of our life reconciliation, healthcare, a pandemic, education, even though the neoliberal frame is what got us into this ecological peril in the first place. Most importantly, for our purposes tonight, this is a dangerous application of narcissistic simplicity. The public in public education is under attack in a culture of manufactured austerity, couched in the language of increased efficiency, greater accountability, and reductions in bureaucracy. You'll remember the siren song of grievance was on full blast in the government's rhetoric prior to the release of the education review and best. The intent? Erode the public's trust in the more democratic governance model we currently have, and then shake their confidence in the work and teach of teachers and administrators. Starve a system, weaken it, vilify the people in it for doing a poor job, then centralize power in the hands of those who are less accountable to the public. Repeat. A survey of 2,000 young people aged 18 to 16 years commissioned by the BBC in 2020 revealed that 73% of the respondents were worried about the state of the planet, 19% have had a bad dream about climate change, and 41%, 41% 
41% do not trust adults to tackle the challenges presented by climate change. It is an ethical and a moral imperative for leaders, for all of us really, to use our shared purpose, wisdom, and passion to fight for a public education system that is responsive to the uh, young people's concerns about their future. Young people need to hear leaders validate their eco-anxiety, take responsibility for the mess we find ourselves in today, and to see us working shoulder to shoulder to lessen the impacts. Acceptance of responsibility also involves political leaders speaking truthfully with young people about global warming, its causes and implications, without justifying the past in order to save face in the present. Time is of the essence. The carbon we burn today severely reduces the carbon margin for those, those born in the future. We might do well to view the limited attention given to the climate emergency by the architects of Bill 64 through the eyes of a child in a classroom 20 years from now. If we can imagine, if we can bring ourselves to do that, to look through their eyes, we would not allow hypermasculine and individualistic conceptualizations of teaching, learning, and leading to drive radical changes to our education system or to deal with climate change dilemmas that are complex, integrative, multi-perspectival, and effectively charged. What we need are leaders who are relational. Cushman describes relationalists as people who live out certain moral understandings that make political commitment possible. In their work, they value honesty, fairness, collaboration, egalitarianism, and freedom. Their commitments to compassion, self-reflection, uh, and intellectual integrity make their analytic practices one of the few places where resistance against the anti-intellectualism, militarism, racism, misogyny, classism, and homophobia of the far right come to light, end quote. In schools across Manitoba, we already have school leaders who recognize their work is deeply connected to the relationships they have with other people. Leaders who understand that public education plays a fundamental role um, in helping to turn to put the other first. These same people help keep our ethical imaginations awake during the pandemic in the myriad of ways they cared for their students and staff during such a good, uh, difficult time. And they would have lots to offer the government in terms of making informed changes if only they were asked. Relentlessly driven to close achievement gaps in performative systems, the moral purpose of ed school leadership is subsumed in Bill 64 by an elaborate fantasy that masks incongruencies and problematic intersections among the democratic aims of education and social mobility. Mechanisms like standardized tests frame schooling as a competitive system in which external accountability measures are instruments of the social good. As a proxy for inclusion, these neoliberal interventions are wolf in sheep's clothing to compel leaders to internalize feelings of shame and guilt when bad test scores are strategically severed from the wider social context. Speaking about COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, the prolific activist and writer Erin Dottie Roy said, quote, historically pandemics have forced us humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Instead of some of the ideas in Bill 64, we could give teachers and school leaders the resources they need to create spaces of curriculum and pedagogy that help young people to understand that all living things have intrinsic value, to reconcile the ethical, social, economic impacts of climate change, to act in solidarity with those who are threatened by the worst effects of it, and to understand their obligations to the more than human world. What we do now will either protect or harm the future we have borrowed from the next generations of school children. I know it would take a great deal of political courage for the architects of Bill 64 to listen and respond to the critiques made here tonight, but I would strongly encourage them to do so. Teachers, school leaders, and young people in Manitoba need and deserve their support to weave new stories to live by so we can continue to build communities grounded in eco-justice, compassion, 
and care for the other. So let me close by saying that any substantial change in education in Manitoba should help us answer the question, what does it mean to be educated in a world that's prepared to go on without us? And unfortunately, Bill 64 is woefully, a woefully inadequate response. Thank you. Thank you, all, all of you, uh, doctors, um, Moore, Coach, and Dr. Farrell. Thank you very much for your compelling perspectives and arguments in regards to Bill 64 and its implications um, for current day and future generations of children. I really appreciate the insights and um, um, perspectives that you bring tonight. We have some questions coming in in the Q&A and I'm doing my best to thematize them and to um, kind of represent the ones that are there uh, most often uh, in, in my questions. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll um, offer the question to any one of the panelists who'd like to, to respond and we'll go from there. And, and um, I would just like to encourage the, those who are in attendance. I, I know that I've, yeah, I'm just looking in the uh, attendees list and I see lots of folks who I know from social media or educational circles. Um, and I'm just so pleased that you're all here. And I know that you're also all seeking ways to respond to Bill 64. And I just want to encourage you again to sign up to speak to the Legislative Committee. Um, and I hope our panelists do so tonight as well. I also encourage you to write to your MLAs um, and to, cons um, and to uh, talk with your colleagues, friends and neighbors. I've been getting a, a lot of questions about it and I think that's important. Um, and it's important to note that we're still seeing op-eds and letters to the editor in the paper almost daily um, uh, front page articles. So I think that the conversations that we're having collectively and individually here together and in other forums are, are making a difference. And so I just encourage you to continue to do so. I think I'll start with a rather broad question and perhaps one that is uh, might draw on your expertise, but also your imagination. And it's in regards to alternatives. And we get asked this question often when we're doing the webinar series. Um, and I'm wondering, because this is such a, 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 the panel tonight brought such broad yet interrelated perspectives. I think this is a good group to ask a similar question of, but what kind of alternatives might we offer in our letters to MLAs, in our conversations to colleagues and friends and neighbors? What are alternatives to neoliberal reforms, to education, to test-based accountability, or to claims of social justice as, as an ideology? How might we imagine education differently? I'm happy Go ahead, Martha. You. I'm happy to jump in on that. I could see that that was coming up in the chat, so I tried to pull a few thoughts together. Um, somebody asked also specifically about this whole idea of intelligent accountability systems. I mean, what does that even mean, right? So I'll just describe it in a little bit more detail and then pass the, uh, the microphone along. Um, these are approaches where we work in flexible ways so that the accountability system might be a little different in each place, might be more focused on what matters in one place than another. Working with a variety of stakeholders groups with an interest in education. That's parents and um, nonprofit organizations and educators and superintendents organizations, all of that, to understand what matters to them in education, to all of those groups in education, and then including those outcomes in the accountability process that we engage in so that we can then make change and move toward uh, things that need to be done. So that means we might be looking at questions like, how are we doing in meeting the needs of students with special needs, right? And if we talk to special needs teachers, they can tell us a lot. If we talk to the parents of special needs children, we can learn a lot as well. We learn nothing about how we're doing with uh, meeting the needs of children with special needs through uh, standardized tests because they actually don't participate in them. They're given, you know, exceptions from those. How are we doing with the number of qualified teachers available in rural or northern communities? 
we don't learn anything about that in our standardized test scores. How are we doing with supporting uh, newcomers to Canada, right? None of that happens with our large scale assessment. Um, we also have lots of insights about how learning is going in classrooms from teachers themselves who spend all day every day with those kids, right? So there's a lot there that we can do um, through a responsive and flexible intelligent accountability system that ensures that what goes into accountability has to do with outcomes, if you want to use that word or another word, parts of education that matter to everybody. Education is a public good, and we all have the right to ask those kinds of questions too, not just the ones that get answered by standardized assessments. Um, so that's kind of some of the ideas, um, but there's there's tons of material out there. There's a lot that the uh, government could be reading and consulting with in terms of progressive forms of accountability um, and not going down this uh, well-trodden and very problematic uh, test-based um, path. I'll pass the microphone over. Thanks, Martha. Alicia or Shannon? Um, I, I would just, Martha spoke so eloquently about that. I, I just think um, instead of investing in testing as though it's a legitimate form of assessment, which we just thought, saw through Martha's presentation is, is not, um, I think increasing funding to deal with the underlying issues that impact people's um, inability to engage in the classroom. So looking at uh, the structures that contribute to poverty um, and as was spoken about in last week's presentation by Abdi, um, increasing support for newcomers, looking at inviting uh, various ways of knowing so that Indigenous folks in Canada feel as though their knowledge systems are represented, um, doing things like meaningful forms of assessment where people are going out and doing quote unquote real world um, activities. For example, in the global issues classroom in grade 12 here, students uh, choose something that they are interested in, that they want to research and they go and uh, do something in their communities to contribute to change, all of which has a, a, a myriad of skills involved. Um, doing more collaborative uh, types of learning in the classroom, deliberation and dialogue, because as we've seen in our society right now, that is much needed. Um, and just actually steeping oneself in the educational research rather than continuing to just repeat over and over again that standardized tests are what is a legitimate form of knowledge, despite Edu educators and teachers and professors consistently telling you that it's not. And then I, I, I don't understand where that disconnect is um, for people continuing to suggest that it's standardized tests that are, are what matters. I'd add um, just a couple of things to what, what Shannon so thoughtfully mentioned. And, and one is, um, uh, in terms of what happens in schools, um, I, I think with the kind of world our children are facing, um, a greater attunement to thinking about education so broadly. The wonderful Deborah Britzman once said, when did education become so small? And that that statement she made kind of haunts me, you know? And, and I think that um, there are so many tremendous things that the kids that kids could learn, you know, in um, what we might call land-based learning, for example. Um, I do think that there are there is some restructuring that needs to be done. I think disciplinary thinking, taking English language arts class, then going to social studies, then going to math class, that is not going to get us where we need to go. We need very radical transdisciplinary thinking happening in schools, in classrooms. And so I'm a person that says, yes, some things have to change. Um, but how we go about that um, needs to be with particular ends in mind. And that's the thing that leaves me wanting um, about about BEST and Bill 64 is, I, I was always asking myself as I was reading through it, to what ends? Um, and so I, I think that the ends are presenting itself in smoky skies all around Manitoba right now. And um, we, could, we could lean on that as a place to get started. And then the other thing I add with would add is something to do with change in particular. I was talking about climate change in an integrated program class at BU. And one of the students in the class put up his hand and said, 
this is this lesson, Alicia, is hurting my feelings. And I said, can you tell me more about that? And he said, because his dad worked on the oil rigs for a really long time, and that's what put Cheerios on his table. And he thought that the lesson was dishonoring the work that his dad had been doing for the last 25 years, the very, very difficult work. And so it is true that people are suffering. It is true that there's some fields that are scared because times are changing and some people aren't making as much money anymore because one thing that one thing that um, capitalism does is it sure does make sure there's some winners and losers. And so in education um, and the people who are researching in education and leading in education, I think we need to get better at talking uh, amongst people who are facing some really pressing challenges in their life and thinking about how compassionate, caring, loving education would benefit would benefit us all, not just the, the really powerful interests, the rich, rich people uh, who keep see, seemingly to get more and more of the pie uh, as, as the years go on. So those are the couple things that I would add. Thank you all for those thoughtful responses. Let, let's, let's take a smaller question then for a second. Um, and this question, I get asked this question quite often. Um, it's come up a little bit in the Q&A, um, not in the chat so much, but let's talk about the cost of education for a moment. Um, and to what do we say to folks um, or how do we conceptualize this idea or respond to this idea um, to which the government is, is telling us that it's too expensive and that we can't afford it? Um, that it's failing, that, that the system is failing, um, and that it's pricey. How do we think about that from your various perspectives? Go ahead, Shannon. I see you ready, chomping at the bit. <laughs> but I, saw, I saw that question, and, and, and I know it was asked before we started speaking, so I wonder um, that the question uh, that the asker may think differently now that they have listened to us. But I reject the premise that it's too costly, and um, that is repeated often, yet, as I said in my presentation, the bulk of the populace in Canada supports a well-funded education system. So the statement that is too costly is just an opinion of that asker, I would argue. Um, and I also don't call it cost, I call it investment. As we've seen in other areas, when, when we invest in people's health and we invest in making sure that they have healthy meals and we invest in making sure that they have shelter, that it reduces, if your only concern is cost, it reduces costs in other social services, like healthcare, for example. So um, I, I see education as an investment rather than a cost. I also reject the premise that it's too costly. Um, and then I also reject the premise of the question that we're failing because again, that failing is, is uh, supposedly based on test results and not on anything else. So I, I might pass to Martha after that because the assumption of failure was based on test results. So I think your whole talk spoke to that though. Thanks, Shannon. I'll keep my comments really, really short here. If it is your perspective and your concern that the education system is costly, I tend to, you know, question some of that myself. But if that is your question and your concern, I would strongly recommend that you repeatedly ask the government how much a test-based accountability system is costing to develop, to purchase, to administer, and to document uh, those results, which even an assessment as large scale as PISA, which has a huge team of folks working for it, way beyond anything our province can ever afford by anybody's standards, tells us that their results provide a snapshot. So how much is that snapshot going to cost this province and how much value does it give us? So however you see the, the money we spend in education, there are many different philosophical takes on that. I would just say, please ask how much that will be costing our province. Alicia, anything to add on, on that one about the cost? I would just, uh, the only thing I would add is that, um, it, um, what we're seeing now in terms of the communications coming out from the government are, is a little bit of, um, uh, I guess to use part of Martha's title, a bit misleading. So for example, like the little uh, star point that, you know, the the change in governance model, so the abol abolishing all the school boards, is going to save Manitobans $40 million. Um, if that's the, uh, I think that's 
I'd like to know where that prediction is coming from and where they're getting their numbers from. So that's another line of questioning we might ask our representatives is where are you getting that number from and um, and, and how do you account for that? Because I haven't seen that yet. So I'm being mindful of those kinds of phrases or um, uh, shiny bits, uh, what Aaron Stibby calls the per words that come out during times of change, um, and digging a little deeper about where they think that money is is uh, is actually going to come from. Thank you. Sorry, couldn't find my <laughs> unmute button, even though I've been on this thing all day. <laughs> um, we just have a couple uh, minutes left. Um, and I want to just once again thank all of our participants who are here tonight and I just would like to draw your attention panelists to the responses in the chat um, and the praise uh, or the appreciation that the um, that our um, participants have uh, the, the yeah participants thank you all again for being here um, maybe we'll just close with an action item um, we, we just have a couple minutes. If there was one thing that you wish the government would do or one thing that you plan on doing um, in your response to this government, um, maybe you could share your insights with us in that way. I guess my biggest wish would be that they listen to educators who are in the classrooms every single day and that they actually explore the educational research rather than having their decisions informed by people who are not steeped in the literature, do not have experiences in the classroom, and may have alternate motivations. I'm just really curious about the unwillingness to listen, and I would hope there's an openness. I would say be transparent and stop being so misleading in your communications. Uh, please do not implement test-based accountability, which is a, 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 an outmoded system from a, a previous era that didn't work and won't work here either. That's not an opinion. That's based on so much research. It's stunning. And finally, um, teachers, yes, teachers will support accountability when systems are built on trust and respect and when their professionalism is what is valued in the system that are here. That is what we see in other parts of the world which do not have top-down accountability systems. So there are other paths to accountability. We get that taxpayers want to know if their money is well spent. We get that many people care deeply about the success of our education system and the impact it has on their children, their lives, and their communities. The way to get uh, toward the accountability that is meaningful accountability is not through test-based approaches. Um, I'd also add uh, another group of people um, that they should speak to are, are young people. Um, they are uh, extremely concerned, and I, I only had time to share a few studies that speak to um, how concerned young people are about climate change, but to not have a, an ex, a strong focus, a strong reorientation um, to take into account um, what's going on related to climate change, biodiversity decrease, all of those things to me is a bit mad at this point in our lives. And so that would be one thing I, I would, um, I would uh, wish that, uh, that they would consider. Thank you, Alicia, Martha, Shannon. Thank you all for being with me this evening and for being with our, um, our guests from across uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan I saw in the chat. So thank you all for being here. I wanna just remind our um, attendees tonight that all of these sessions are recorded and are being broadcast um, through the University of Manitoba Faculty of Education YouTube channel. Um, there's been some requests to share this information, so please do feel free to, um, to uh, find us there, to share the sessions with others. Um, and as we've been talking about, please reach out to any of us here via Twitter, email, however you prefer, um, and also be talking to friends and neighbours. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be resuming, we're going to take a little holiday break. Um, but we will re be resuming our webinar series in the fall. So please attend to our um, Twitter account at the U of M Faculty of Education um, or any of us will be advertising um, and, and we'll be taking up the series again in the fall. And I really look forward to seeing you all there. So on that note, thank you to the panelists. 
thank you guests and, and attendees for being here tonight. Um, have a very nice and safe summer, everybody. Um, and we'll see you in the fall.